Hello, people. Uh, okay. Um, there's something I want to discuss today. First of all, in the last month, I've been described as a child molester, a drug addict. Um, what else has it been? Um, lots of stuff. Every week it's something new. And now I'm being discussed as uh, someone uh, robbing uh, a woman in my life's uh, bank account. Now, all this stuff is BS and it continues. And you got certain channels that just pick up on it. They love talking about it. Uh, these channels have not put out anything worth listening to in quite a while. It's like a gossip mill. You know, you have a couple people on the channels and they're all gossiping and it's like uh, uh, what they're doing is platforming people that come on and talk shit about other people. Um, that's just the way it is, though. We have to deal with that. Um, it's not going to hurt me no matter what they say. If you don't find a body in my trunk, you can say whatever you want, okay? Even if you found a body in my trunk, you still have trouble. And um, my nose itches. No, it's not cocaine, people. I'll be the fattest cokehead in the world. Okay, but what I want to do today, uh, besides discuss that silliness, um, here's a commitment that I'm making to people. I did a show yesterday with um, Tom Ovecchia, and it came out great. We had a running time of 30 minutes average, which is a phenomenal running time whenever you do a show. And the only thing I could say to that is thank you to everybody that made that possible. And I'm very proud of the fact that you can have a show uh, with 30 minute runtime. That means like right now we're at one and a half thousand watched and the average video uh, for a good interview is six minutes. And we did five times that. So the video is like an actual 10,000 view video. Um, that's how the, the numbers are figured out uh, with YouTube. And runtime, which I always say, and people make fun of it, but it's the truth. Runtime is the most important thing when you're doing a video. Hands down. Because then you put up commercials. There's a certain amount of commercials that stay up. And these commercials are very important. Okay, I want to do something today. We hear quite a bit. I'm going to uh, about whether John Gotti Jr. did a um, 302. Yes, we know he did a 302. But it's like one of those things. People don't want to discuss it. You know, they 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 want to pretend it doesn't exist. So what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back, uh, uh, Costa Nostra News um, wrote a great article on it, and it was by Ed Scarpo. And Ed Scarpo, uh, he's been around for years, and this article was written uh, January 26 of 2015, and it discusses the 302. Um, the article, of uh, it says, FBI 302 proves John Gotti talked. Not ratted, he talked. Let's make that very important. It's not my job to determine what I think about it. It's my job is to present it to you and then you'll make your decision what you think about it. And um, that's what it comes down to. You could say that um, it's not snitching. It is snitching. It's not ratting. It is ratting and come to a conclusion. But the fact of the matter is we cannot pretend that a 302 wasn't done. We can't make exceptions for one person and call everybody else a rat if he did a 302. And um, personally, I like John Gotti Jr. I think he's a very smart man. Uh, but at the same time, I think that he gets a big break that a lot of people don't get. Uh, and if he did do a 302, you got to remember the government was really prosecuting him really hard and they wanted to put him away. And he was sitting in solitary confinement for a long time. And he claims he just wanted to get out. So he gave them nothing uh, except names. But you're going to decide that because I'm going to read it. Uh, this is called uh, uh, 
um, the story of, uh, oh, I don't want to even put the name in here of John A. Light, but this is from Gotti's Rules, the book. And um, Anastasia put this in the book, but Ed Scarpo kind of uh, cleaned it up and wrote an article on it for Costa, uh, Costa News. Let's see. I'm sorry. Uh, Costa Nostra News. And also, Ed Scarpo did an article uh, a couple of days ago on my show, which I appreciate. Uh, it was a nice article, you know, kind of fictional, nonfiction. And he, you know, uh, we, we talked and uh, basically it was some type of interview and he did an article on my show. Uh, but OK, so right now I'm going to uh, kind of start this off. Uh, OK, the meeting occurred at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Lower Manhattan on January 18th, 2005. The 302 never revealed to the public is solid evidence that despite all John Jr. Jr.'s denials, he and two of his defense attorneys met with federal prosecutors and FBI agents. Um, as noted in the previous story, Jer Jerry Capisci first broke news of Jr.'s attempt to cooperate, but the 302s go even further in terms of extent of information Jr. gave up. One of the more shocking revelations emerged from the memo is that James Jimmy Brown Fiella, um, 19, uh, 19 to 1999, and Joseph Joe Butch Carraro, 1936 to 2001, had personally summoned uh, by the Lucchese crime family to witness the torture of James Heidel, confessed that he shot at Anthony Gaspipe Casso, an attempt hit ordered by Angelo Salvatore Rosario, uh, who died in 89. Guest Pipe had demanded Rosario's death, according to Junior, who added that Senior refused to comply, shelving his longtime friend and criminal cohort instead. You know, I like to say one thing about Angelo Rosario. The reality, Angelo Rosario should have been clipped way before this. Uh, and with all the stuff that he did, he was basically uh, not good for the family, the Gambino family. I mean, they got him on tape talking about uh, uh, heroin, uh, talking about um, um, Castellano. And if that was anybody else besides John Gotti Sr.'s best friend, he would have been clipped. And, um, the re and you got to give it to John Gotti, who is very loyal to his friends, but in my opinion, he was too loyal to Rosario because Rosario was doing some really, he wasn't a very good gangster. I mean, he made mistake after mistake after mistake. And he always got away with it. Um, eventually he died of cancer and he didn't die uh, the way a lot of people thought that he should have. Um, and once again, um, I'm not saying he should have. I'm just saying what people thought. Uh, okay, so what follows word-for-word -word replication of a five-page FBI 302 memo of debriefing John A. Gotti back in 2005? Uh, let's see. Uh, John A. Light, who read it, said it was typical Gotti attempt to lay blame on others. He said the version of events depicted Junior, at least the events that A. Light acknowledged, is a blend of fact and fiction. The allegations in the memo were not presented as fact for the purpose of the story, but merely to show Gotti met with authorities and in a ver very real sense was willing to throw names of other mobsters, businessmen, and elected officials into his descriptions of the criminal activities of the Gambino family. Okay, uh, this is from uh, January 16th, 2006. John A. Gotti, also known as AKA Junior Gotti, uh, protect identity, it says, was present at the United States Attorney's Office, Southern District of New York on Pearl Street in New York on January 18th, 2005 for a proffer session. This meeting was arranged at Gotti Jr.'s request. Also present were Gotti Sr.'s attorney, attorneys, Jeffrey Lickman Esquire, Mark Fernich, Esquire, as well as the United States attorneys, Robert Bueller, June Kim, 
Jennifer Rogers. Uh, after Gotti Jr. and his attorneys read the proffer agreement, the terms of the agreement were explained to them by Aus, Aus Gotti Jr. So, uh, signed the agreement. Gotti Jr. therefore provided the following information. This was on the murder of Danny Silva. And one thing, when you're going to do a 302, you have to give up the th crimes you did. And if you don't give them up, and if they find out that you... Uh, did say a murder and you hit it from them. They will basically drop everything. They will take your um, your 302 away from you. They will take any type of deal you had away from you. Uh, so the murder of Danny Silva, John Jr. is sitting down and he's putting it out there because he knows that he has to be truthful about that murder. Okay, and uh, that's a sign right there that he was well aware of what he was doing. In the early morning hours of either March 11th or 12th, 1983, Gotti Jr., along with friends Mark Caputo, Anthony Amoroso, were present at the Silver Fox Bar located on 101st Street and Liberty Avenue in Queens, New York. At some point, Tommy, last, uh, last name unknown, a.k.a. Elfie, approached Gotti Jr., who was sitting in the bar with a female friend, Donna. According to Gotti Jr., Elfie repeatedly bumped into him. Words were exchanged, one thing led to another, and Gotti Jr. ultimately hit Elfie with a broken glass bottle. Gotti Jr. then stabbed Elfie with a knife that Gotti Jr. had obtained from Amoroso. Uh, according to uh, Gotti Jr., a melee ensued involving approximately 30 to 40 patrons of the bar. Gotti Jr. recalled that among those involved in the melee were Danny Silver, John and Greg Mazza, Angelo Castelli, Joey Cario, uh, first name unknown, Riley, uh, John Sinamo, Gotti Jr. stated that Danny Silva was stabbed and killed during the melee. Gotti Jr. described the meeting, which occurred a short time after the incident at the Silver Fox between Angelo Ruggiero Sr. and New York City Police Department Detective John Daly. Gotti Jr. drove Ruggiero to the meeting, which took place at the Sherwood Diner, located in Five Woods on Queens-Nassau County border. Before Gotti Jr. and Rosario discussed the purpose of the meeting, according to Gotti Jr., Rosario was carrying a brown paper bag containing $25,000. In cash, Gotti Jr. observed Rosario sit in the rear of the diner, meet with Daly, an unknown white male. Rosario advised Gotti Jr. that the $25,000 cash payment was made to Daly to get his... Uh, name out of the Silver Vox murder investigation. While Gotti Jr. did not directly meet with Daly, Daly did acknowledge Gotti Jr. on his way out of the diner as Gotti Jr. sat in the waiting car. Following the meeting, Rosario and Daly, Gotti Jr. was instructed by his father, John Gotti Sr., to leave New York for a while until things cooled down. Gotti Jr. left New York for Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, where he may remain for some time. At some time, Gotti Sr. joined him in Florida, and the two eventually returned to New York. Upon Gotti Jr.'s return to New York, he learned that John Sinamo, one of Danny Silva's uh, friends who was present at the Silver Fox that night, was stabbed and killed, uh, the night the Silver was stabbed and killed, uh, was dead, apparently having hung himself. <laughs> the good old hanging himself. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, Gotti Jr. provided the following as a background. Angela Rosuri was put on the shelf by Gotti Sr. after the murder of Jimmy Heidel in 1986. Heidel was tortured and killed by members of the Lacazy organized crime family because he, Heidel, and others had shot and tried to kill Anthony Guest Pipe Casso. Uh, the Lucchese family learned that Rosario was behind an attempt to kill Casso and demanded that Rosario himself be killed. 
Gotti Sr. was very close to Rosario, did not have Rosario killed. Instead, Rosario was put on the shelf. Prior to Heidel's murder, members of the Lucchese family summoned Gambino members Jimmy Brown Fiella, Joe Butch Carraro, to a location where Heidel was being held. According to Gotti Jr., uh, Fally and Carraro we summoned to the were, were summoned to the location. Uh, they would be present when Hytel admitted his and Rosario's involvement in the attempted murder of Casso. Prior to the Lucchese killing, Hytel, Fiella, and Carraro obtained Gambino family member Danny Marino's approval to kill Hytel because, according to Gotti Jr., Hytel was Marino's nephew. So now you have Junior talking about this murder. He's sitting down and talking about the Heidel murder. And um, eventually uh, that could come back and haunt somebody and force somebody to take a plea. Um, we'll just leave it there. Even though Rosario was put on the shelf, Gotti Jr. continued to meet with him in violation of mafia protocol. Gotti's father reprimanded him on occasions for meeting with Rosario. Gotti Jr. learned from Rosario that in the weeks and months after Silva was killed at the Silver Fox, Sanamo uh, uh, continued to pressure the police department to investigate Silva's murder. Rosario told Gotti Jr. that Sanamo pressed his uh, Gotti's name in the investigation and uh, his Gotti Jr.'s role in the bar fight that led to Silva's murder. Rosario told Gotti Jr. that he, Rosario, and others have obtained New York Police Department DD5S, official department, uh, police department reports of the Silva murder investigation from Daily Rosario, then advised Gotti Jr. that Sanamo's death uh, which appeared to be a suicide, was in fact murder and that he, Rosario, Joe Watts, Willie Boy Johnson, had killed Sanamo on Gotti Sr.'s order. Rosario told Gotti Jr. that Detective John Daly provided background information regarding Sanamo, uh, which the Gambino family used to locate him. So here you got... Uh, a, a police detective giving out information um, to where this guy is. And this is part of the 302. So there's a lot of talking going on in this 302. It's not like just this simple 302 that we're led to believe. You know, when you really think about it, I mean, there's a lot of names involved here. You'll hear the names. Oh, some of these guys are dead. But the fact of the matter, some of them weren't dead. And even if they were dead, the fact of the matter is that they were being ratted out. Rosario's dead, so he was still being ratted out. Several years later, after Gotti Jr. was arrested on eight unrelated charges, an additional cash payment was made to Daly when Gotti Jr.'s name resurfaced in the Silver uh, murder investigation. Gotti Jr. stated that his father was arrested and remanded to prison in 19, December 1990. Gotti Jr. frequently met with Joe Watts, who was close associate of Gotti Sr. At one meeting with Joe Watts at the Lum Chin, uh, Lum Chin Chinese restaurant, Watts admitted his involvement in the murder of Sanamo. Watts also told Gotti Jr. that the first piece that was the first piece of work he, Watts, was involved and was the murder of Vito Borelli uh, in approximately 1980, which he committed with Gotti Sr. So Vito Bore uh, Borelli's murder, pretty much Joe Watts is saying that he did it with John Gotti Sr. So the fact that, you know, you hear John Gotti never really killed nobody. Sammy said that. Sammy's wrong because there's a couple instances now where you heard about Gotti Sr. actually getting up close and personal. Um, according to Gotti Jr., John Daly was assigned at 106 precinct during the time he received the payoffs from the Gambino family and provided information to the Gambino family 
about the silver murder investigation. Gotti Jr. added that Daly later went to work for the Queens District Attorney's Office. Oak Point garbage dump. At some point in the late 1980s, Gotti Jr. and others wanted to develop approximately 28 acres of land located on the Bronx side of the Triborough Bridge. This tract land was known as Oak Point and at the time was being used by New York City garbage dump. Uh, Gotti Jr. and his associates wanted to build module homes on the property through a company known as Bright Star Homes. In addition to the housing development, Gotti Jr. wanted to get involved in construction of the Bronx House of Detention on that site. Uh, Gotti Jr. had received assurances that he would be able to sell the prison to the, new, to the city of New York for $20 million. And that's all, you know, that's all interesting stuff, though. Gotti Jr. wants to buy a property to build a prison and then sell it to the city of New York. Kind of, a, kind of ironic when you think about it, you know, uh, with everybody in the mob eventually going to prison, uh, the man is here wanting to sell a prison uh, to the city of New York. Um, but it's business, and there's no doubt that John Jr. was a smart businessman. According to Gotti Jr., Dave Norkin, a partner of Gotti Jr.'s in the venture purchase of the property, Gotti Jr. advised bribes were paid to at least two politicians in order to secure city permits required by the development project. Uh, Joe Singaro, a captain of the um, Gambino family, had close relationships with Bronx politician Ephraim Effie Gonzalez, who was a very popular New York uh, politician. So it's, uh, it's obvious Effie was on the take. John Gotti Jr. gave him $20,000 in cash to Singaro for Zingaro to give uh, to Gonzalez. According to Zingaro, Gonzalez accepted the $20,000. Gotti Jr. used the alias John Russo, met Gonzalez at a function, and they both attended at Alex and Henry's Catering Hall in the Bronx. Okay, now you have Jr. tying politicians to taking bribes. So this 302 becomes a little bit more than people will let on to. Uh, according to Gotti Jr., additional bribe money was paid to uh, Fernando Ferrar, big-time politician, through Norkin. Norkin suggested making the payments to Farrar, according to Gotti Jr., on at least two different occasions. He, Gotti Jr., gave $25,000 in cash to Norkin for Norkin to give to Farrar. Gotti Jr.'s close associate, Michael McLaughlin, delivered the money. Gotti Jr., uh, again using the alias John Russo, also met directly with Farrar at Norkin's office. According to Gotti Jr., the bribes paid to Farrar did secure whatever permits John Gotti Jr. Uh, needed and his associates needed to obtain for their project. In addition to the payments described above, Gotti Jr. paid an additional $100,000 to $125,000 in cash to various pol city politicians through Norkin. The, uh, the last firm, David uh, Malato, um, in order to grease the skids in the development of the housing project and the uh, detention center, excuse me. After Norkin purchased Oak Pint, Gotti Jr. and his associates continued to operate the, the garbage dump from approximately January 1989 uh, through the late August 1989. Gotti Jr.'s guys, including McLaughlin, uh, McLaughlin yeah, worked at the dump. Gotti Jr. stated that investigators with the city uh, Department of Investigation, the DOI, or another New York City investigative agency, photographed Gotti Jr. at the garbage dump on several occasions. Once the photograph evidence of Gotti Jr.'s connection to the property surfaced, uh, Gotti uh, Jr.'s investors and business associations no longer wanted to be involved and the project was never completed. So pretty much, you know, here he is. He wants to get these buildings built. He wants to sell them to the city of New York. Um, 
but he was pictures were being take of him, taken of him. So it scared the investors because they knew that it was going to bring heat down on everybody. Um, kind of interesting because I never heard that. And approximately the spring of 1990, Gotti Jr. and other Gam uh, Gambino family members pursued another project involving a garbage dump. This dump was located at Matamoras, Pennsylvania. Gotti Jr. attended a sit down with other members of the Gambino family, as well as high ranking members of the Lucchese family concerning this project. On behalf of the Gambino family, which Gotti Jr. continually referred to as our family, Gotti Jr., his uh, uncle Pete Gotti, Salvador Sammy the Bull Gravano met with representatives of the Lucchese family. Aldo Narco, Anthony Gaspipe Casso, Patty Maselli, according to Gotti Jr. The deal to purchase to operate this garbage dump fell through. So, you know, here you are, you got this 302, and he's basically stating Peter Gotti, Salvador Sammy Gravano, and representatives of the Lucchese family uh, were, were, were part of the deal to purchase and operate this garbage dump, but it fell through. Um, so this is becoming more complicated than just a simple 302 where he sat down and gave a couple names. And um, I just find it quite interesting. Gotti Jr. also stated that Gambino family member Anthony Tony Lee Guerreri and his relationship with local politician Sal Riel the Gambino family had influenced the Queens District Attorney's Office while John Santucci was the district attorney. John Santucci was a big time district attorney, too. Uh, Gotti Jr. identified Mike Coro as the um, Gambino family's go to guy. Gotti Jr. also advised that, Guerrero, that after Guerrero died, the Gambino family lost their influence with the Queens DA office. Okay. Well, you know what, people? That's it. A interesting article, but I had to read that. And the main reason I had to read that is because you hear a lot of things about 302s. And um, whose 302 is more serious than the others? Is there a such thing as doing a 302 where it, it's minor? There were a lot of names mentioned in that 302. And there, some of those people are still alive. Joe Watts may have been forced into taking a plea deal because of that 302. There's no guarantee that happened, but it, there's a possibility it did happen. So you got to ask yourself, does John Jr. deserve the same break that he's been getting? Now, Sammy Gavano knows about that he was mentioned in his 302. And maybe that explains a lot of reasons why uh, the Gaudis are kind of bending over backwards to be nice to Sammy Gavano. Listen, this isn't because I have a heart on for anybody, okay? I don't. But, you know, part of having these shows is trying to present things that are fact. And, you know, what was just presented there is fact, people. And it has nothing to do whether you are a Gotti fan or not. This has to do with, was there a 302 done? And how serious was it? You know, if you're going to talk about um, someone, say, uh, Michael Fran Francis. I mean, he had one 302. There was one person involved. Uh and the guy wind up beating the case. But if you look at Michael Francis 302, it, it's, it doesn't touch that one. This one has much more in it. We're talking politicians. We're talking cops being named. We're talking gangsters being named. Sure, a lot of them were dead. But there were some guys in that 302 that were not dead. So it's for you people to figure out what you how you want to take it. You know, there might be people upset that I just read that, but all I'm doing is presenting fact. You know, it's not like I'm presenting something that's a lie. You know, this is out here. 
you know, and it's not the actual 302. That 302 was actually written based on what uh, Anastasia learned about the 302. Um, it's impossible to come up with these actual 302s uh, because uh, they're taken out of evidence and no one can see them once they're done. And that's what happened uh, with anybody's 302. But for some reason, this was leaked to Anastasia, and Anastasia found it was worth putting in the book. And then Ed Scarpo uh, defined the story better. So I hope people like that. Uh, I just found it quite interesting. And I'm happy that I'm getting to start doing stuff like this, and you're going to get more of it. I'm going to try to put out something knowledgeable every day and stop this silly fighting crap between all the channels here. And um, that's it, people. Uh, please like the video and subscribe to my channel, please. Uh, as you know, I always forget to ask you to subscribe. I'm almost at 2,400, so please help me get there. And we're almost at a half a million views. Um, which I'm really proud of because I never thought I'd get to a half a million views in three months. Uh, and it's a big thing. You know, there's other channels here that have reached it already. And congratulations, congratulations to them because it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, we're just a couple of, uh, well, there's people here that, you know, whether it's MRE, whether it's Fat Bull Sicilian, we're just a couple of, guys that are doing the shows on our own and when you get to that half million mark it's a big thing because that means people are listening and once again yesterday's uh video that i did with tom uh Lovacchia was uh fantastic um we'll probably get about two thousand views on it but it's not the two thousand views it's the fact that it has 30 minutes runtime per average, which is incredible. And it's nice to see that. That means people are involved in these videos and they like them. And uh, everybody have a nice one. Don't forget, smash those buttons. Take care, people.